Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Father, I just want to thank you once again for the opportunity that you've given us to feast upon your word. I just ask that the Holy Spirit would take and strip away all that which is foolish, but seal to our hearts only that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. In this series of videos, we're studying together in the epistle to the Romans, verse by verse, and I believe that we've reached verse 12 of chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. This has been somewhat of a tough passage uh, to study, uh, to work through for me, which is the reason for the delay in this video. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, so also death was passed on to all men, because all sinned, for sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who did not sin in the way that Adam transgressed. He is a pattern of the one to come. Uh, these three verses are somewhat tough. So I'm, I'm going to attempt to break these three verses down in a way in which we can see the thought that I believe that the Holy Spirit intended to convey. But let me say, first of all, to skim through these verses is to leave Christians poorly equipped to understand what we really believe and what we stand for. Death reigned from Adam to Moses. There was no law. I don't believe that it is correct to say that there is no sin where there is no law. In fact, it's because of sin that law is required. Uh, I could say that, you know, before they posted a speed limit through my small country village here, it was still a sin to speed. Uh, angering the, the lives of, uh, of people, uh, endangering the lives of children and other vehicles passing through the area, slinging dust and, and dirt, you know, on women's wash that was hanging on the line. And because it was obviously a sin to speed, the county, my county, got together and they decided to pass a speed limit law. Why did they need a law? Well, they needed a law because it was a sin to speed. The law made the sin abound. The effect of Adam's transgression was that sin reigned even in the absence of any law. Nobody, after Adam to Moses, ever sinned by breaking a direct commandment. But Cain killed Abel. Nobody can convince me that there existed a law, thou shalt not kill. But it, it was a sin to kill. So we see death reigning from Adam to Moses. So it wasn't the breaking of the law that caused the death. It was Adam. As many of you know, Adam was the federal head of the race, and in him all mankind subsisted. And when Adam sinned, you sinned, and I sinned and the race fell. 
So death reigned from Adam to Moses. And we come to the 15th verse in our study here. Romans 5, verse 15. And because of the marvel of that phrase, we are struck with the wonders of Christian doctrine. Not as the offense, so also is the free gift. Well, the first two nouns there, end and mu alpha in the Greek. If a noun ends in sigma iota sigma, it's simply a mention of the action described by the noun. But, if the noun ends in mu alpha, then the writer wants you to understand that in that noun, he's talking about the accomplished result of the action described by the noun. So, in one case, we're looking at the result of a described action, and in the other, we're looking at a described action. But not as the offense. And I, and I want you to understand it isn't looking at what Adam did, but at the results of what Adam did, if, you're, if, if this makes any sense here. It isn't just stressing the fact that Adam sinned. It is, it is stressing the result of Adam's sin, which was that death reigned even from Adam to Moses. And from Moses on, of course. The result of Adam's sin was the reigning of death. So also is the free gift. And the noun ends in Mu Alpha. Now I've put this up on the screen so that you can look at this and maybe it'll help clear up, make it more clear what I'm talking about. It isn't just looking at the action of Christ's sacrifice. It's looking at the resulted action of that gift. And the, the problem is, modern Christianity says there isn't any resulted action until you do something. You know, Christ made it possible, you make it sure. That's modern Christianity. You know, there's a, there's a gift hanging out there, and you know, if you would just reach out and grab it, you know, then you could make it certain. That's modern Christianity. And according to modern Christianity, the noun ought to end in sigma iota sigma. But it doesn't. It doesn't. It isn't, it isn't only a free gift. It's the result of the free gift. For if, and the, the word if, it's a first class condition. For since, through the offense of the one, the many be dead. Much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by the one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many, or unto the many. I'm going to suggest, because I believe it very strongly, that the reason the many, uh, the, 
pillowy. It's, it's articulated both places in this verse. It's because it's the same group of people. What the offense did to a group of people in death, the free gift of grace did to that same group of people through Jesus Christ. That same group of people through Christ. It isn't that they could potentially receive the effects of that gift. The reason, folks, the reason the noun ends in mu alpha is because the work of Jesus Christ was absolutely applied in the same way in which the work of Adam was applied. Are, are, you, are you following me here? They're, they're both the result of the action. Now, that, of course, is going to be emphasized tremendously by the time we reach the 19th verse. The human mind struggles with the concept of God Almighty making people alive, spiritually, without their cooperation, without synergism. It's a hard, hard struggle. And almost universally, the verses are read as though, well, you, you didn't, die potentially in Adam. You actually you actually did die in Adam. However, however, you're only made alive in Christ if you respond and folks, that is not what the text is saying. It's not. And a careful examination of the grammar says if you look at it carefully, what it says is, it says that that what happened in Adam was reversed in Christ. And more than that, more than that, more excellently than that. I don't know if, if that's a word, excellently. More excellent than that. Verse 15, the verse begins... But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. Now, I'm going to do something here that I don't really like doing. I'm going to preach. You know, uh, there's a difference between teaching and preaching. I'd much rather prefer teaching. Now, I've preached the gospel for over 30 years now. And I know that my sojourn here is not much longer, that our Lord is returning for us soon. And I am, and I've said this before, I'm greatly concerned that, that you folks are well grounded in the truth of this book. God declared that certain things were unclean, one of which is a pig. And, and I... You know, I happen to, to, to really like hunting wild boar. And I, and I have scores of articles in my study on why pork was declared unclean by God. You know, can't, uh, you can't freeze it as long. They carry certain kinds of disease, and it goes on and on and on. Not one minister, not one Bible student, not... Not one theological seminary graduate that I can find ever wrote the simple truth that the pig was unclean because God said so. Because, because God declared that animal unclean and so, because he declared it unclean, are we to spend hours and hours in research trying to figure out why? Or, 
were we to learn that it is God who declares what is clean and what is unclean. Look, God told the children of Israel not to use linen and wool, okay? We have all kinds of research. Why wouldn't you put those two together? Well, the garment tears. The two claws don't work good together. Because God is teaching that we were not to combine the truth of God's word with anything else. That's, that's what we see here in this. God told his people, we can read it. Take heed to thyself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land in Deuteronomy lest it be for a snare for you, you shall destroy their altars, break down their images, and cut down their groves. You don't hook an ox and an ass together to plow with him. Why? Why don't you do that? Why? Because they don't work well together. No. No. Because you don't combine two different systems of doctrine. It is astounding to me. Absolutely astounding. Where, where the so-called Christian church is. I mean, what, what, does, what does the word Christian mean? I mean, Jehovah... Jehovah's Witnesses, they call themselves Christians. You know, they, they come to my door here and, and they call themselves Christians. Mormons call themselves Christians. Uh, you know, Pentecostals call themselves Christians. Protestants, they call themselves Christians. Catholics, Roman Catholics, they call themselves Christian. What does the word Christian mean? You know, there's a Greek word, un euangelic. Uh, euangelizo, I believe is the word, from which we get evangelical. It's amazing the people who call themselves evangelical and have no idea what the gospel is. How convoluted can society become? We're living at a time today Air, today, error is, is love and truth is hate. Take note that, that what you see taking place in the, in the political, cultural stream of society, which I don't really like talking about, that's not my ministry, is just as rampant within the so-called religious system of our day. Same thing. And as never before. I made the statement that one well-known evangelist uh, was stupid in his theology. Now, now the statement's true. The statement is very true, but I received scores of criticisms. You know, I was unloving, uh, you know, unchristian, unkind. I was truthful. When has it or, or where have we gotten that in the Christian church, we are so politically correct that we won't declare truth? Islam is Satan's theology. Now, if Google picks up on that right there, they'll, they'll probably take this video down. You know, you're just pouring gasoline on the fire when you say that, uh, you know. You're exercising an exercise in hate. You're making the situation worse, not better. We live in an age when there are multitudes, multitudes of biblical organizations in, in Bible studies, Bible studies groups, uh, whose greatest aim, their primary, it seems like their primary objective 
is to avoid doctrine. Time and again, when I'm asked to speak, you know, it's Steve, don't bring up doctrine. That divides. That causes hate and differences. Oh, Timothy, take heed unto doctrine. So, in for in this way thou shalt both deliver thyself and them that hear thee. And, and folks, doctrine's the only thing that I know. If we give a, a hundred question quiz to the average Christian, he cannot distinguish between Romanism and Protestantism. It means two things to me. God declared that the shepherds of Israel were leading his people astray. First of all, apparently Christians aren't well taught. And secondly, they, they apparently aren't feasting on God's word. They're, they're spending very little time in this book. People have talked about the love of the Lord you know, there's a group of so-called evangelicals who met and, and they actually met and signed an agreement that we should try to love one another and bring all of these different churches, denominations, belief systems, religious systems together. What we really want in this country, I, I you know, I don't, many of you are not just, they, you, many of you live in other countries, I know, but what we want in this country is just, the, uh, I don't, I don't know how would I say it. Uh, we want leaders without conviction. That's what we want. That's what we want. Leaders without conviction. Sounds really a whole lot like what I watch on network news, except, well, that's politics, but I'm talking about the same thing. The only reason there are differences in people's thinking is doctrine. And what we have to do is subjugate doctrine to, to, to love and unity. And folks, I will not do that. And I don't want you to do that. When harsh language is used today, and many of you who follow me on Facebook, you've, you've seen me do this use pretty harsh language it's always criticized look at the lord let's see okay all right he, he called them hypocrites he called them children of hell sons of the devil blind guides whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones full of all uncleanness full of hypocrisy and iniquity serpents generation of vipers <laughs> sounds pretty unkind and unloving to me but but truthful. Truthful. Where are the Christians that stand for truth? I've often wondered, and I know, and, and many of you out there know, that I tend to speak what's on my mind a lot. It tends to get me in trouble a lot. And don't really care about, I, you know, I, I am... I have no interest in whatsoever in creating some new denomination or being someone's guru or building some great mega church with millions of followers. You know, uh, at least I've been honest enough to admit that. Christ said, he said, get thee behind me, Satan, to, to Peter. I don't know what that did to Peter. But I've often thought about the other other disciples joking among themselves. Hey, let's call him Satan from now on. Now, I don't know that. Uh, you know, I, I don't have any right to do that. But he said it in the presence of the other disciples. And Peter was a brother in the Lord, redeemed by the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Get thee behind me, Satan.
And I find Christianity today unwilling to call error for what it is. Error. For example, the gospel. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. That's strong language, folks. The gospel is not, you must be born again. Now, I, I'm going to shock a few people here, all right? That's not the gospel. That's error. The gospel is not, you must believe on Jesus Christ. The gospel is not, you. I, there I've lost probably all of you. The gospel is not, you must accept Christ as your personal Savior. The gospel is not that you must have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The gospel is not that you need to realize that you're a sinner, and as a sinner, in realizing that you're a sinner, you need a Savior. The gospel is not. You need to make him Lord of your life, and I could go on and on and on and on and on. The gospel is are you ready for this? The gospel is a historical fact. Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. If Jesus Christ is not God a very God, as, as well as man a very man, then you don't know the gospel. If Jesus Christ did not literally become our kinsman redeemer, become flesh, take upon himself the form of a man, and be made in the likeness of man, and took upon himself the form of a servant. If those things are not true, you don't know the gospel. If he did not literally live and preach on this earth, you don't know the gospel. If he didn't die on the cross, you don't know the gospel. If he was not buried, dead, you don't know the gospel. And if he did not arise from the dead, literally and physically from the dead, you don't know the gospel. The gospel is an historical fact. It's not something that you do or you are to do, you should do, must do. In the 30 years I've been teaching the word, I don't know how many times I have been I've been asked. I, don't, I know it's got to be thousands. How can I be born again? And I think, wow, how convoluted can we get in our thinking? What baby ever decided to be born? Birth is the responsibility of the parent. You are born from above. Because God is your heavenly Father. You are redeemed because Jesus Christ died in your place. And you believe that because you're redeemed. What has happened in the Christian church? They've decided that Basically, they decided that Protestantism isn't, isn't any good anymore. We'll go back to Rome. And what does Rome teach? If you believe, you'll be redeemed. That's what the Christian church teaches. I don't. I don't. That, to me, to me, that is satanic error. It blasphemes the name of my Savior. He died in my place so that I am his sheep, and he 
is the one who declared, why don't you believe my word because you're not my sheep? And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, a thousand ministers tell me, you can become a sheep if you'll just believe. Well, I, I must not know how to read. Why don't you believe? Because you're not my sheep. My sheep are the ones, said Jesus, are the ones who hear my words. And my sheep believe on me. So in order for me to believe, I have to be a sheep. Folks, what did we ever do to turn this all around? And here, this is my personal belief that, and many of you have seen some really stunning events take place as it regards abortion lately, just, just the past few days. Without even getting into that subject, it's it's so gut wrenching. I mean, I, I have few soft spots left. Kids are one of them, but we have the first person to ever praise God in the you know womb was John the Baptist, and he's the one coming. That, that's he's the one who came and preached, "Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand." Well, look, I said I wasn't going to go that direction. But where have we departed so far from the word of, of God? It's my personal belief that you were seeing much of what is happening now because the church has not stood up for the truth and stood, stood up for doctrine. That's my personal belief. That it's become so convoluted so turned around the cart before the horse so back turned upside down backwards and all around that we're seeing a lot of the things that we're seeing today lesson after lesson he gives us i mean we're given we're, we're shown this time after time again what did the firstborn son do in the Passover not to die? Nothing. Nothing. People say to me, what do I have to do to go to heaven? Nothing. Nothing. If God is your father, that's where you're going. God isn't your father. That's not, that's not where you're going. I get emails all the time. How, how do I know whether I'm a sheep or a goat? Do you believe? Because only sheep believe. You don't become a sheep by believing. And folks, you can evaluate whether or not you're one of God's sheep by whether or not you believe. Just be careful what you believe. It will not be long if it isn't already here. That one who is true and faithful to this book, to the word of God, is the enemy of the state. True, conservative, faithful Christianity is despised today. God's work can't get done unless we advertise greatly. Marvelous sermon, Steve. Should have had a million people hear that video. Really? Well, we don't. Tr well, we don't trust a God who can't get out to hear what I had to say. I mean, if that's if that if that's the case, I mean, if God can't get people away from whatever they're doing to hear what I have to say. To hear what I have to pray to, to preach or teach, then he's not the God I want to worship. Are you telling me that there's somebody in, in YouTube land 
who God desperately wanted to hear some message I preached, but, but God couldn't get him, him or her there. God couldn't get him to click on this link. And I have seen that same disappointment expressed after many a sermon in many a church over the years. I've seen them cry. Oh, great message, you know, too bad, you know, more didn't hear it. Look, the God I know is working in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure. The God I know works all things after the counsel of his own will. The God I know is not unwilling to say, if evil happens in the city, the Lord God did it. And we have all kinds of so-called Christians hedging on the sovereignty and the majesty and the power of our God. Folks, what a privilege that you have to stand for truth. But let me tell you, you're rare if you do. We are more concerned today about hurting people's feelings than we are preaching the truth. Again, it parallels politics. We are more concerned today about driving someone away than, than we are sticking faithfully to the truth of God's word. When, when Jesus Christ never pulled any punches A whole group before him. And what did he say? This is why I said unto you, none of you can come unto me unless my Father, which is in heaven, forces him. Well, we don't want to believe that. I am astounded how rapidly the Christian church has become Roman in its theology. Most of the Christians I talk to will violently deny that. Yet when we begin to evaluate their theology, it's Roman theology. If you stand for the truth, you're going to be a Jeremiah who stands alone, cast in a pit. I, I don't know how much longer we'll be here, but I want to drive you to this book. I don't care whether you like me or don't like me, but I want you to know the truth of this book. I want you to know the God who declared that it is he who chose you before the foundation of the world. You had nothing to do with it. And I want you to take comfort in that because it's true. It was he who gave you birth from above. You had nothing to do with it. Don't go around and boast that you preach the grace of God and then say, it's up to man. The grace of God is his grace without a cause. How many times have I pointed out? We, we did this in, in Romans chapter 3. For all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. That's that is that that verse or that phrase, I should say. That's soul winners verse 101. It isn't even a verse of scripture, it's a phrase in a long sentence. If you'd even if you'd just complete the phrase, it'd be wonderful. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, having been justified freely by his grace. How were you made righteous? By God's grace. 
Anything in you? No. Anything you did? No. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. You were made righteous without a cause. This is what the text says. Remember, dearly beloved, our fourth chapter ended. He was delivered because of our offenses and he was raised again because, because we're made righteous. You know, I hardly run into a Christian anymore who believes he's made righteous. Oh, he thinks he will be someday, or he might be someday, and there's a whole lot of them out there that never, that don't ever think that they will be, but apparently doesn't believe he's now made righteous. Have you ever really delved into the truth, the marvelous truth, that he who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him? And we were. What do you do with that Savior on the cross who was made sin? If he was not made sin, then you were not made righteous. Something had to happen. And the Word of God says that he who was made sin for us was justified in the Spirit. It was God who looked upon the travail of his soul and was satisfied. The price that he paid was sufficient. And did you think of the marvelous revelation of God's grace? We suddenly add human works, human response, human repentance, human belief, human this, human that, who knows what. I don't find one Christian in a thousand who's read the word of God enough to realize that regeneration and salvation are not the same thing. It's like an apple and an orange is not the same thing. I'm astounded that people can take a Greek word and dump into it everything. Just throw everything into that one into that one word. What does salvation mean? Oh, it means justification, righteousness, repentance, reconciliation, atonement, and they go on and on and on and and by, by before they're done, they got a long list of what doesn't. Redemption means redemption or ransom. Righteousness means righteousness. Salvation means deliverance. I'm the first one to agree. So, somebody wrote me an email one time and said, this verse seems to say that this person was saved by her faith. And... and and I wrote back, doesn't seem to say that at all. It does say it. It says it. You are delivered by trusting Christ, but you are not redeemed by trusting Christ. You trust Christ because you're redeemed. You can go to heaven unsaved, but you cannot, you cannot go to heaven unredeemed. You're not going to eliminate the finished work of Jesus Christ. You're not going to do that. And if you stand for the truth of the fact that you, ungodly, we're told in verse 6, enemies, Enemies, not working for God, not searching for God, not one single one who does good and sinneth not. And all of a sudden, 
all of a sudden, God, before the beginning of time, chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy without blame before him in love. You suppose he lost that? You suppose he couldn't do that? He did it. How wonderful. The privilege. The privilege to carry the good news to redeemed people. They're not redeemed. They can't hear. They're not redeemed. They can't receive. If they're not redeemed, they can't believe. What grand news. No wonder it's called the good news. Breaks. It breaks upon my heart that Jesus paid it all, that I stand before him spotless. How many times when I've said to people, he died for you that he might present you holy, unblameable, <coughs> holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Well, well, that works for Paul, but, you know, not for me. What is God, a liar? How are you presented holy, unblameable, and unreprovable? By the way you live? By, by the way that you believe? No. A thousand times, no. By the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And what the modern church has done has exalted man and diminished Christ. I mean, it's a strange thing, you know, I get, you know, to say. But if God sent me to hell, I, well, all I got was what I deserved. But he lost everything. He lost his honor. He lost his honesty. He lost his righteousness. He lost his justice. Exacted a penalty from Christ, and then he exacted it from me. God lost everything. That's God. And I, well, I only got what I deserved. He couldn't do that. And yet, by far and away, the bulk of modern Christianity believes a person is redeemed by what he does. Not by what Christ did. And that reduces the finished work of Jesus Christ to nothing. We're told in Corinthians, don't do that. Spend time in this book. You spend time on television. You spend time in reading the news feed, you know, buzz feeds. You know, you spend time in sports. You spend time in travel you know, recreation, you spend time, God knows, doing what. Spend time in this book. Make it such an inseparable part of your life that, that though the fig tree does not blossom, nor fruit be on the vine, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, though the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stall. Yet you will rejoice in the Lord, you'll joy in the God of your salvation. The Lord God is my strength. Oh, I pray that that's your portion. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word and for the privilege that we've had to think about it again. And again, I asked 
that the Holy Spirit strip out that which is error but seal to our hearts the truth of your word that we might stand that we might stand for the truth when there are none to stand in the gap for these precious folk I pray that Christ and his finished work may be very real and very dear to them for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. This is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for listening.